Welcome to worship at Baptist Temple in the Houston Heights. We are so glad that you're joining us today for this special and holy hour of worship. Today is the fifth Sunday of Eastertide, and we continue to join with Christians around the world in celebrating today the risen Christ. This Sunday is Mother's Day. And although we are not here together in the temple, we can still wish all of you who are watching from home a very happy Mother's Day. As we often remind you, the purpose of this day of recognition of mothers is not only to honor those in our congregation who are mothers, but to honor all mothers, stepmothers, mothers-in-law, and as well, all of those special women in our lives who have been a mother to us when we needed them the most. The beautiful altar flowers that you see here this morning are provided in honor of all mothers, those who are here with us and those who have already gone on to be with Christ. Today we're joined in worship by violinist Mr. Jonathan Moody. Jonathan is a student at the University of Houston's Moore School of Music and he serves as our sanctuary choir tenor section leader. Thank you, Jonathan, for sharing your gifts on the violin with us this morning. If you do not have the worship guide in front of you, I encourage you to pause this video now and go to baptisttemple.org, click online worship, and click to read or download the worship guide to assist you in participating. Again, thank you for joining us in worship. May the peace of Christ be with you all. for the significant role that mothers play in the lives of their children. O oh Lord, we are so thankful for the ones who fixed certain character traits in us, spoke words of guidance, called us to high accomplishments, 
disciplined us and taught us the hard lessons of life. Today, as we honor our mothers, may we cherish the sacred thoughts that come to us by remembering. May we recall her sacrifices, her direction, her love, and her faith, which touched us in so many ways. And help us to remember that we reflect our parents not only in the way that we look, but also in what we become. As well, O oh God, we lift up the mothers who still live among us as they continue the journey with us. May they be blessed with a special sense of your presence and the power of your love. May they remain courageous in doing what is right. May they remain constant in their commitment to their family and their faith. And may our honor for these special ladies not cease when this day is done, but remain constant each day and every day as we all put our trust in you. And we ask for these things in the strong name of the one who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. <laughs>
last part of Acts chapter 2, where just after Pentecost, Peter preaches his very first sermon, and he has one of the most astonishing and remarkable responses that anyone could possibly imagine after, their, after preaching their first sermon. We're told that on that day, there were 3,000 people who, who responded to faith in Christ, and then we are told that, that all of those believers, well, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teachings and to fellowship and to breaking bread and to to prayer. It's a tremendous, beautiful response to what Peter had said. And today we see really a contrast to that. We see, well, someone after giving their first sermon, the worst possible response imaginable. To any sort of sermon. It's the kind of passage that should give preachers everywhere some comfort because if you're a preacher who only has to deal with complaints from people in the congregation and maybe at the worst get fired, well then you should think you're lucky stars because it could be far, far worse. Things go much, much worse for Stephen after he preaches his first sermon. He is hauled off and stoned. Before we get to this story about Peter stoning, we need to back up a little bit to gain the proper perspective on this story. The truth is that the passage about Stephen stoning, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense unless you know a little bit about what comes before it. We're essentially jumping from, from the second chapter of Acts last week to the end of chapter 7 in Acts this week. But all of this probably takes place over a period of time that's a little less than two years. There's actually a lot of really important things that happen during this time, but in general, those, those chapters reveal that the church is growing and the church is spreading and it's being propelled out into the world. And all of this is happening despite the fact that there is tremendous opposition that they're facing. Opposition from those religious authorities who, who will not leave them alone. And yet, we see again and again during this time, over and over, how God makes a way when there seems that there is no way. And during this time, we're, we're introduced to a man named Stephen. In fact, he appears on the scene in Acts chapter 6. A problem had come up. Some of the widows were not getting a fair distribution of the food that was being handed out. And when this was brought to the attention of the 12 disciples, they decided that the best way to, to handle this was to allow the people to select seven people from among them to oversee the distribution of the food. If these seven people who were overseeing the distribution, they're, they're, they were called deacons, which is essentially just the Greek word for servant. If they handled this kind of duty, then the 12 disciples, they could devote themselves, put more of their time and their energy into prayer and proclaiming the word. And Stephen was chosen to be among these first seven deacons by the other followers. So it's probably worth noting that when he was picked to be a deacon, that there was probably somewhere between well, 3,500 and 5,000 Christians that could have been chosen for this role. They only picked seven, and Stephen was among them. So it seems reasonable, at least, to conclude that Stephen was a person of exemplary faith and character and stature in this early Christian community. We don't know a great deal about Stephen, but here's what we do know. We do know that he was a Jew and a devout follower of Jesus. When we, looked at, when we look at the text in a few moments together, I think you'll find that, that Stephen has a, a genuine faith and piety that's expressed in his prayers and his actions that lead up to his death. As well, on multiple occasions, Stephen is described as being filled with the Holy Spirit. And in Acts chapter 6, he's also described as as being wise and full of grace and power, a person who did great wonders and signs among the people. And ultimately what happens to Peter is, uh, to, I'm sorry, what happens to Stephen is kind of interesting. He's arrested on trumped up charges of blasphemy. 
We're only told that one day when he's out there doing these signs and wonders that he gets into some kind of argument with two men. And, well, the result of all of this is that a secret plan is hatched to silence Stephen. Even though it's not true, two people were found who were willing to testify that they had heard Stephen speak blasphemous words about Moses and God. And they found two additional people who were willing to falsely testify that he was saying terrible things about the temple in Jerusalem and the law and Jewish customs. Again, none of it was true, but if he's found guilty of these charges, it would be enough to silence Stephen for good. According to the Old Testament laws, the penalty for someone guilty of saying these things, well, the penalty was death. So Stephen is taken into custody and he's hauled in before the Sanhedrin, which is that same group that oversaw the trial of Jesus. And even though this is a horrible situation, it's not difficult, at least, to imagine how this could have been an ideal opportunity to bring the good news to, to leaders of his people. Remember, Stephen is one who is known for being a person who had wisdom and grace. But instead, Stephen uses this moment to take on the entire religious establishment. Even though he is the one that's on trial, he assumes the role of the prosecutor and he accuses the Sanhedrin of being guilty of being blasphemous and disrespectful to God's laws. He, he gives them this long lecture that summarized the entire biblical history to these people who were, well, who were in their positions because they were experts in that biblical history that he was telling them about it. He ended this lecture with harsh insults and rebukes that would have embarrassed and insulted every single one of them. Essentially, Stephen's message to the Sanhedrin is, you have not believed the prophets, the, the truth tellers, and the gospel preachers for ages because they said things that, that didn't match your beliefs and your perceptions. And you're doing it again. It's not me who's guilty of these charges, Stephen says. You are the ones who are guilty of this. He could have defended him, himself against these bogus charges, but instead he told the truth about the Sanhedrin to the Sanhedrin by cutting through all of the sanctimonious garbage that they passed off as piety and, op and opposed the work of God. So in a moment, We'll come to the part of the story that reveals the events that take place after Stephen's big speech. As we hear this story and consider it together, I want you to, to avoid assuming that, that you and I should more closely identify with Stephen in this story. Sometimes, some of us probably are like Stephen, and he's a marvelous example for us in those moments. However, I tend to think that most of us, most of the time, are more like those Jewish leaders whose ears are closed to the truth. The story, it warns us against being like them because you and I have a tendency to avoid the truth. The story, it's a reminder that we should listen carefully to people who think differently than we do, and we should listen to them with discernment especially when they are saying something that contradicts the things that we already believe. 
this first part of the passage together, I should warn you that, well, that it's a difficult story to hear because for the most part, you probably won't like the way that being a person of faith is presented here. I think for the most part, you and I like to think of faith that when it's presented in a compelling and truthful way that it changes hearts and minds and it, and it creates a better future for everyone involved. But the truth of the matter is, is that sometimes our faith, it has the potential to, to arouse, well, the deepest kinds of hostility in others. And that's the kind of thing that we find here at the end of the seventh chapter of Acts. So if you would look with me now at Acts chapter seven, beginning in verse 54. When they heard these things, meaning the things that Stephen had said in his speech, when they heard these things, they became enraged and ground their teeth at Stephen. But filled with the Holy Spirit, he gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God, but they covered their ears and with a loud shout all rushed together against him. Then they dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. And the witnesses, they laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. While they were stoning Stephen, he prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he knelt down and cried out in a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he said these things, he died. Well, considering everything that Stephen had said to the Sanhedrin, it's not surprising that his message was not well received. And what we see afterwards is in this passage is this terse and vivid account of Stephen being murdered. The Stephen's executioners, they were infuriated and, and unwilling to listen to reason. And they exhibit this kind of rabid violence that only thirsts for blood. Verse 54, it says that Stephen's words enraged him. In the original language, the idea here is that their, the, his words had ripped through their hearts. And the grinding or gnashing of teeth, as some translations put it, is a common biblical expression that signifies hostility and rage. And it's used especially in those kinds of scenarios when wicked people have hostility and rage toward righteous people. However, while they're being enraged and grinding their teeth, we get this unusual, really beautiful account of Stephen's vision. And it's got this very joyous tone, which is surprising in the midst of all that's taking place here. Stephen, we're told, is filled with the Holy Spirit and with a vision that is clearer to him than his accusers. He could see beyond this earthly courtroom and could look and see the majestic courts of heaven. And he says, look, I see the heavens opened up and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. I think there are a couple of things that are important about Stephen's vision. And the first one that I want to point your attention to is, is how Stephen sees the exalted Lord. Well, the fact that that in his vision that Jesus is standing at the right hand of God, almost completely without exception, any other mention of this kind of scene that talks about Jesus being near God and ascended to his, to his glory, what we find is that, that, that Jesus is always sitting at the right hand of God. So why in this vision that Stephen is having, why is Jesus standing at the right hand of God rather than sitting? As you can imagine, commentators throughout the centuries have offered their explanations for this particular difference. Some suggest that Jesus stands to, to welcome Stephen into his presence, and others suggest that Jesus rises to, to make an intercession for Stephen. Still others suggest that Jesus gets up to, to come to Stephen's aid. Another theory is that Jesus stands in judgment against Stephen's murder. The truth is we can only speculate about the reason for this unique detail. However, I think all of these 
possible explanations. They point to the fact that, that Jesus is actively watching. He's involved and, and he's responding to the need that Stephen has in this moment. And I think you and I can expect the same from him. The other thing that's noteworthy about Stephen's vision is the response that it causes from these religious authorities of the Sanhedrin, that this chamber that they're in, it's already lacking in decorum, but, but after Stephen talks about his vision, it now becomes a mob scene. They conspired in this effort to kill Jesus. And if Stephen's vision is true and Jesus is standing at the right hand of the Father, then they were horribly wrong about Jesus. And they're also horribly wrong about Stephen. So unless they're ready to repent and to confess to this awful mistake, then the only thing that they can do, the only choice they have left is to silence Stephen. You get the sense that they knew that they were wrong because we're told that they closed their ears and they started shouting at the top of their lungs. The whole scene is almost kind of childish and comical. It's the kind of scene that you might expect in an episode of Little Rascals where they're, where they're trying to, to, to isolate themselves from, from hearing something they don't want to hear. And then, in order to stop him once and for all, they rush him and they take him outside of the city to stone him to death. They don't even bother with the normal sorts of things that you would commonly expect. Sorts of things that we saw them do in Jesus' bogus trial. They, they didn't bother to take a vote on Stephen's guilt or innocence. They, they didn't bother to get permission from the Roman authorities, which was actually really important because Roman law was quite clear on this matter. The Jews could not execute someone without their explicit permission. So the scene that's taking place, the Jewish leaders taking the law into their own hands, they're acting in, a, in an illegal manner and they're breaking their own Jewish laws and the laws of the Romans who ruled over them. Nothing about the events that happened here reflect what usually took place. This isn't a trial and an execution. The only word for this is that it is a lynching. Because Stephen had to be silenced at all costs. So this storm of opposition that had been building throughout the book of Acts in chapter 2 and 3 and 4 and 5 and the beginning of chapter 7, this, this, this growing storm of opposition that, well, it finally, it finally breaks through with all of its fury. And Stephen makes no attempt to flee or, or to resist them, but there's probably very little that, that he could have done to save himself at this point anyway. However, in spite of the, the violence of the crowd, Stephen, he's able to get the very last word with his final breath. He, he prayed for the Lord to receive him, and he prays for his attackers in a way that reminds us of the way that Jesus prayed for his executioners from the cross. Forgive them of their sin. So what does all of this mean for you and for me? What are we meant to glean from this story? Well, again, I think there are a couple of ways of looking at this particular story. We can look at, look at this story and try to identify with Stephen. And if this is our perspective, then we should be certain that we have not tried to overly domesticate our Christian faith, making it too safe and too acceptable, too neat and too sanitized, only presenting faith that, that's acceptable to, to the culture around us and their sensitivity. Do we really reflect the, the character of the kind of Christianity that's described in the pages of the New Testament? Are we willing to speak the truth when it is needed, even if we know that it will create a hostile reaction? And so for those of us considering it in this way, we must ask ourselves, what difficult truth 
do we need to say and to whom must we say it? But we should also consider that perhaps our real place in this story, it might be among those religious authorities who stoned Stephen. Stephen has presented them with the truth, but it doesn't match what, what they want to hear. It doesn't match what they already have decided. It doesn't match their preconceived ideas and beliefs. So they quit listening and they silence the uncomfortable truth. And I think it's a tricky balance that has to be made here because in some ways these religious leaders, they, from their perspective anyway, they are also speaking the truth and acting on their strongly held beliefs, but they just happen to be wrong. And I wonder how often we are on the wrong side of matters of faith. Because for whatever reason, it doesn't match what we want to hear. Because for whatever reason, it doesn't match what we've already decided. It doesn't match our, our preconceived ideas and beliefs. Are we certain that we should not listen to any of the voices around us that take a different stance on important issues? And how certain can we be that our opinions and our beliefs on every topic that they reflect the thoughts and the intentions of God. For those of us who see this passage this way, this passage serves as a warning. Let us pray. Almighty and holy God, you have called us to follow in the way of your risen Son and to care for those who are our companions, not only with words of comfort, but with acts of love. Seeking to be true friends of all, we offer our prayers on behalf of the church and on behalf of the world. Guide us in the path of discipleship so that as you have blessed us, we may be a blessing for others bringing the promise of the kingdom near by our words and deeds. In the name of Christ Jesus, the one whom we praise and adore, and in whose precious and most holy name we pray. Amen. The Old Testament lesson today comes from Psalm 35. In you, O Lord, I seek refuge. Do not let me ever be put to shame. In your righteousness, deliver me. Incline your ear to me. Rescue me speedily. Be a rock of refuge for me, a strong fortress to save me. You are indeed my rock and my fortress. For your name's sake, lead me and guide me. Take me out of the net that is hidden for me, for you are my refuge. Into your hand I commit my spirit. You have redeemed me, O Lord faithful God. My times are in your hand. Deliver me from the hand of my enemies and persecutors. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We come now to a time of offertory. We remember that all that we have is God. As an act of worship, it is with joyful hearts and out of an abundance of riches that we now return to God a portion of that with which he has blessed us. Although we are not meeting in the temple together, the church's operating expenses continue. We encourage you to go now to baptisttemple.org and click Give Online. You can also mail a check to us at 230 West 20th Street, Houston, Texas, 77008. Give cheerfully, thanking God for his blessings of light and life. During this time of offertory, Devote yourself to God in heart and in mind and in spirit. <laughs> 
together this morning has really been challenging for me this week, so I've thought about how to deal with it and to give you some sense of what I think it might mean for us today. So let's, let's read it together. It's, now it's Acts chapter 8, beginning in the second part of, of verse 1. It says, That day a severe persecution began against the church in Jerusalem, and all except the apostles were, were scattered throughout the countryside of Judea and Samaria. Devout men buried Stephen and made loud lamentation over him. Saul was ravaging the church by entering house after house, dragging off both men and women. He committed them to prison. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Here's why I think I find this passage difficult, because I really want to believe that that we have lessons to learn from the mistakes of these religious authorities, but we're primarily met, I think, from this passage to identify with Stephen in this story and that he is supposed to be for us this example that we're meant to follow. Courage and speaking the truth. And this is not an isolated or anecdotal example of of this kind of courage and speaking the truth in difficult moments in the pages of Scripture. You might be surprised to learn that that there are numerous passages all throughout scriptures, both in the Old Testament and the New Testament, about people who are taking principled stands on their faith and telling the truth, even when it was uncomfortable or dangerous to do so. I could give you lots of examples, but I'll just give you a few here. Daniel and Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego, they come quickly to mind as an example from the Old Testament. And John the Baptist and the Apostle Paul are good examples of people who, who took unpopular and courageous stands for God in the New Testament. But this is also something that we find Jesus himself doing very often. Perhaps you remember in Luke chapter 4, Jesus' first sermon that he gives in his hometown. And he says to them that the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He's sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind and to let the oppressed go free. To proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And then, after saying this, the crowd in the synagogue on that day, they... Well, they, they rush Jesus and they try to kill him by throwing him off of a cliff. And maybe it's because I find myself wanting so badly to be like Stephen. But a little unsure if I really have the guts to do the kinds of things that he did. I, I think because of that, I really would have preferred if this next part of the story gave us a a different ending to all of this. I don't like reading that in the face of this severe persecution that all except the apostles were, were scattered throughout the countryside to Judea and Samaria. Essentially, it's saying that they are fearful and flee. It probably implies here that they were not courageous. Some did not take those principled stands of faith. Some did not speak the truth to the authorities because they were they were afraid of what might happen to them. So instead of staying there in Jerusalem and doing that, they, they leave. It would have been so much more encouraging if we could have read that everyone in the early church, they, they followed Stephen's example and they took this, these, these principled stands, kind of a, a remember the Alamo kind of thing here. We do get evidence that some were courageous. Some did follow Stephen's example. The persecution against the Christian church in Jerusalem as it ramps up. More and more lives are put in danger. However, we are told that the apostles, they don't flee from Jerusalem. They stayed there to, to do the work that they were called to do despite the very real dangers that posed. We're also told about a few devout men who stayed behind to, to bury Stephen. And I even think it's significant that, that it tells us that they were very loud in their lamentations. Because 
this kind of thing would have certainly endangered their lives. And there were still others who did not leave. We're told that there are some who are dragged out of their homes, both men and women, and put in prison. And at the end of the day, Stephen's death and all of this other suffering that occurs and the imprisonments that occur, well, surely, surely this must have been endured well, it just seems like it could have, all of this could have happened in a much different and better way. What good could come of these hardships? What good could have really come from, from this kind of faithfulness? The Sanhedrin was certainly not impressed, and none of them were converted, and the spectacle of Stephen's death, it, it only seems to to so, be so emboldening to at least one of the forces who sought to squash the Christian movement that Saul goes from being the guy who watches everyone's coat to being the guy who's leading the charge and hunting down the people in their houses and imprisoning them for their faith in Christ. And yet Saul, the one who would eventually become known as the Apostle Paul, it being mentioned here, I think, foreshadows a change that is moving even in the face of Stephen's death and all of this other violence. The one who heard and saw all of the events concerning Stephen's death, he eventually, he eventually comes to faith in Christ. And although he could have never guessed it in this moment when he's watching Stephen's death, Saul or Paul is getting a glimpse into what the future will hold for his own life, seeing firsthand the consequences of speaking to truth to the powerful. Of course, it would take another more startling intervention by God to transform this persecutor into one, into the one that we know as the Apostle Paul, but there is no doubt that this story about Stephen, it must have played a role in Paul's decision to convert. Our own courageous and true words, our own loving and truthful actions, they may also matter in the reign of God in ways that we cannot possibly imagine. St. Augustine said that the church owes Paul to the prayers of Stephen. And I think he was right. The things that humans meant for evil, God used for good. And yet what I think we find in all of it, in those who were bold and courageous like Stephen and in those who fled in fear, I think we still find the grace of God and the unstoppable power of the gospel. Even though they fled Jerusalem to safer places and go out into the countryside of, of Judea and of Samaria, God is not done with them. Out there in those remote places in Judea and Samaria, outside of the watchful eyes of the powerful people in the big city, those who fled, they must have found God's grace and God's forgiveness there. Out there in those remote places in Judea and Samaria, they find the courage to do what they had not done in Jerusalem. They spoke the truth, took courageous stands. And the Christian movement takes an important leap in those moments. It goes from being just an isolated sect of the Jewish religion in Jerusalem to, to a movement that was beginning to grow and expand just as Jesus had predicted at his ascension when he told them, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and to the very ends of the earth. Things that humans intended for evil, God used for good. So I think we're meant to understand that no matter who we are, no matter where we have been, no matter what we have done, that we are loved by God and we are still useful to God. You likely know that Stephen is credited as being the church's first martyr. Did you know that that word martyr, it's a transliteration of the Greek word for witness. So to be a martyr is to be a witness. 
And while you're likely not going to be called to die for your faith, you are, in fact, called to be a witness in this world to the things that you have seen and heard and to those truths that you know without any doubt in the core of your being are true. My prayer for us all is that we might find the courage of Stephen and boldly tell those truths and talk about those experiences, bear witness to those things that we know when the truth needs to be heard. But knowing that we're all weak, I also pray that we might all find the love and the grace of God in those remote places of isolation and despite our past failures that we might become useful to God again. Amen.
his face to shine upon you and grant you peace. May the Lord give you the grace to never sell yourself short, grace to risk something big for something good, and grace to remember that this world is now too dangerous for anything but truth and too small for anything but love. Now may he take your minds and think through them. May he take your lips and speak through them. And may he take your hearts and set them on fire in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs>